Hello, Quantum Explorers. And 3D printing dreamers. Oh, nice. Welcome to our second episode of the Quantum Kid, who is actually here with me. Hi, I'm Kais. As you've heard from the first episode, I am still learning quantum, but I am almost the quantum expert. That's the spirit. Well, um, Kai, you mentioned 3D printing, which is actually really cool. And you, you've got something there to show us, right? Oh, yeah. This is my 3D printed panda, Pandy. And here's a close up of it. Um, and also, he's very ragdolly. Nice. It's actually uh, really great because we will be talking about um, the benefits of quantum for manufacturing today. And 3D printing is, of course, super relevant. So we've got a great show for you guys today. And we've got two amazing experts joining us. Right, Kai? Yes. So Frederick and Antonio, right? Exactly. Frederick and Antonio. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, guys. So we've got uh, Frederick Flother from Quantum Basel, the first commercial quantum hub in Switzerland, and Antonio Linares, an executive from a mid-sized uh, global company working in manufacturing. Really great having you here. Likewise. Happy to be here. So, Frederick, since you are in the field of quantum, I still don't know where Qubit is. Okay, welcome to my club. I also do not understand it very well. Reminds me of uh, Richard Feynman, who famously said, uh, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> so I don't think many of us actually fully, fully will ever understand quantum mechanics. Uh, Frederick, what's your view? Yeah, so a qubit, it's really the fundamental unit of information that you compute with. So classically, if you have a classical computer, you have bits. So these are the zeros and the ones. And then you have with the quantum computers, you have these quantum bits, the qubits. And the magic there is that we exploit the quantum mechanical properties, things like superposition, interference, and entanglement. And uh, that allows us then to perform novel kinds of algorithms and calculations. So for example, you can then exploit the fact that you're not just working on the zero or you're working on the one, but you're working on the zero and the one at the same time. Qubits can be both artificial and also natural, right? Exactly. Physically, you can realize those in different uh, two-level systems. So because large things like people, uh, they don't exhibit uh, quantum properties generally. And so that's why we need to use small things like atoms, ions, photons, superconducting circuits, things like that as qubits. Could you please tell us a little bit more about the systems that you've got in quantum Basel and maybe some other systems too? Sure. So each of those different physical systems you use, uh, they, each of them has advantages and disadvantages with regard to working as a qubit and uh, being able to build a very powerful quantum computer. And for instance, uh, at uh, Uptown Basel, so this is the innovation campus where Quantum Basel is situated, we actually have the first uh, commercial quantum computer of Switzerland there on site. So this is based on trapped ions as the qubits uh, by a company called IonQ. And uh, there it is possible actually that you use lasers in order to manipulate these qubits there are all kinds of different physical systems. And depending on the application, you might actually use different kinds of systems in order to perform your operations. So at Quantum Basel, we also then have partnerships, for instance, with IBM, where we use superconducting qubits, and then also with D-Wave, uh, where we perform what's called quantum annealing, uh, that is also based on superconducting circuits. That's great. Um, so Kai, you were showing the Panda earlier and Antonio is working specifically in manufacturing. Antonio, do you think quantum computers might be of use uh, to your company? I'm sure that quantum computers can really make um, a big um, step forward in terms of, of our capacity to develop different models and understand the best uh, working formulas. For example, we use different materials, alloys, and, and combinations of different raw materials uh, and, and uh, the formulation, the way they are going to behave, the predictability of their behavior is fundamental to, to prepare uh, to prepare a system of production that will generate the minimum rejects and the minimum uh, the minimum defective pieces yeah so as soon as that will grow and spread we will be very attentive to try to benefit and to see how to bring it to our production sites and manufacturing sites 
So the technology right now, it's a young technology. So it's not science fiction, but it's somewhere between lab and industry. It is also not a, a finished commercial product as such. And uh, that's why it's so important to also consider that quantum algorithms they will not solve every problem, unfortunately. They are not a silver bullet that just makes everything faster and better. But one really has to do a careful mapping where you take the algorithm and then you see whether such an algorithm maps to the problem you're trying to solve. For example, in manufacturing, you already touched on some of those interesting problems that can be considered in terms of the material science side, in terms of production planning. That's a very interesting one. Also in terms of the supply chains and the risk modeling in, in that space. In that, uh, I can actually also mention two examples of uh, such projects which have already been running there. So one partnership we've had has been with Pfizer, where we've been using quantum annealing that I mentioned earlier in order to optimize actually these production planning steps in order, in order to really reduce this make span. So how long does it take from the start that you make a product until the end when you're finished? And in another example uh, of such a project, uh, we've been working with Mercy Energies and there actually it's been about optimizing so-called HVAC systems, so heating, ventilation, air conditioning. And there you have something called a network generation step where you try to actually get the optimal layout of these systems. And that is computationally very intensive. And uh, also there we've been able to map these quantum algorithms to the problem at hand and uh, get very interesting results. You have mentioned some of the issues that we have as open issues and that are usually uh, at the front of our permanent fight for getting and delivering better service. Yeah? So definitely, yeah, I see that. This technology, um, it is really something that cannot be considered in isolation. So the quantum computers will not make the classical computers go away anytime soon, but it, it has to be considered how is it integrated in computational pipelines? How does it work together with machine learning, with artificial intelligence? And that then really allows you to get those benefits by combining those different uh, approaches in the best possible way. Frederick was now mentioning about HVAC and, and we, for example, we're mo we are modeling the behavior of water and, and modeling a fluid is always a complex thing. And particularly if it is a fluid interacting with products and interacting then with complex systems such as buildings, how will it flow? How can you reutilize the water that is falling for generation of energy eventually? So I feel that that can be many fields of application, definitely. Yeah, very cool. And um, Kai, you had a question about 3D printing, right? Do you want to show what you what you made? And because uh, we we mentioned quite a few uses of quantum computers right now for manufacturing. So what do you have there? I have a book stand. I created it on my 3D printer, so I can put a book on it, like this book, and just put it on it and it would stay on and I'd also lock it on like that. I love 3D printing and use it all the time to make lots of things. But Frederick, he can quantum computer and 3D printing work together somehow? Well, the nice thing with when you have such a young technology like quantum computers, you can consider problems of today, but then you can also look towards the future and see uh, what kind of new problems might arise or what new business models might be possible. And so with 3D printing, another emerging technology, uh, many people expect really to be growing in, in use and popularity. We can imagine that as 3D printing spreads, we then have to, for instance, distribute these parts. So if there's a lot of 3D printing, a lot of uh, parts that get repaired, they then need to be shipped, for example, also using drones. And so maybe then this creates new challenges in logistics. So that would be kind of a derived opportunity there where quantum algorithms might be able to optimize some of this distribution of those parts more directly with 3D printing. One can also imagine that uh, there will be optimization of uh, trying to use materials which are even more suited for 3D printing. And we already mentioned earlier that material science is a great opportunity for quantum computers to help discover uh, some new substances uh, for use. Yeah, that, that's uh, indeed, uh, we talked about optimization a little bit in the last episode as well, uh, but material science is something that would be, of course, of interest to a lot of companies, right? And uh, yeah, 3D printing, 
uh, is right up the street as well. So could you explain how quantum computers can help with creation of uh, new materials? Well, if you want to build new materials, you have to look at the fundamental level. So there you're dealing with atoms and the particles that make up these materials. And so in order to find what can be a new, a better material, you then have to consider how can I uh, simulate these interactions between the atoms, between the molecules, and try to come up with a, uh, a better structure, which then gives me certain properties that I want. For instance, maybe I want greater hardness of the material, or maybe I want greater flexibility, whatever the case may be. And uh, because you're looking at this fundamental level, so there you're in the domain of quantum mechanics, where you see those effects that I talked about earlier, the quantum algorithms, they are very naturally suited to do those modeling calculations. And that's why uh, there's great promise in the space uh, of material science for quantum computing. If I may step here, because I, I used to be into, into modelization of behavior of materials in the very early years with finite elements method and Fortran. And you can imagine the level of simplification and in this very binary programming we had to, to accept. Yeah? And, and through this simplification, of course, the capacity that you had to really do our engineering of materials was very limited. Now, with one quantum computing and the level of complexity can really explode. Yeah. If we talk about material science, then uh, manufacturing obviously is, is an area of great importance. And then also the pharma sector is very important there because it, it's all about finding those next drugs. And if we look at the literature around in the order of millions or tens of millions of uh, compounds have been reported, but it is believed that this so-called chemical space, so all of those potentially pharmacologically active molecules that that's uh, something like 10 to the 60. So a big, 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 big number, meaning we have so far only covered a tiny fraction uh, of all of those potential combinations. And that's why uh, it, there's so much promise uh, for pharma, for manufacturing to try to come up with these new uh, molecules that have desirable properties. Kai, if you wanted to make a new material, what would that be for? Maybe like a very light but stable and strong material for a plane. I would love to have a very light but strong material. Basically like foam combined with steel. Do you think it's possible, Frederick? Time will tell, but Kai's requirements are not not easy to meet, I think, for any kind of computer, quantum or classical. Yeah, but if we look at, at nature and, and that insects in nature, we can find uh, insects that are uh, able to really hold uh, enormous amounts of load or pressure, uh, depending on, on which animal we are talking about. Yeah, And then to be able to investigate the nature of, and explore it for new materiality, yeah. Kai, do you like going to hospitals? No. Now imagine, imagine for a minute if if you would have a sensor in your toilet that would then, uh, through quantum computers, be able to do an analysis, and then from that and through a very uh, strong computing of all the possible symptoms that can be identified with one state of health or another, without having to visit a hospital, would give you a diagnostics. Would that be possible, Frederick? So I think uh, this exact product you describe, uh, I'm assuming it will still take some time uh, to get there. However, the spirit of the application of the algorithms is something that's already being researched today. So for instance, uh, being able to discover these biomarkers, so what are all the earliest signs of maybe your health status changing. And uh, in fact, it's also part of a, a paper that uh, we recently uh, published in that space. So definitely very, very promising for healthcare and beyond just being able to discover some of those patterns, some of those correlations, which uh, with traditional classical methods that we have not been able to discover so far. Very interesting. So I think we're getting close now to the end of the episode. So Kai, do you have uh, any last comments or questions for any of our guests? Not really. Maybe I'll get a few more in 100 years. Since last time it took me 1 million, I think, okay. but it took me one week. All right. Well, Antonio, do you have any other questions for Frederick, maybe? 
No, I mean, I, I think Frederick is, is of, a, of a young generation, and I think it is amazing what, what the quantum computing with the many other technological new findings and breakthroughs that we are seeing in these times can bring uh, in terms of additional levels of quality of life. And But also we need to keep vigilant that this is not then taken over by, by private hands, that this can really be spread and, and distributed to the population and, and will not be in the wrong hands. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it is definitely important with these emerging technology to in parallel to progressing the applications, also to foster the discourse on the ethics around around their uses. And one of the really nice things with quantum computing is that it is by its nature so multidisciplinary, and that is why uh, we can have such an interesting conversation here. And also when looking at how this technology can be used, it really requires that input from people from very different fields in order to, uh, to, to discover the best uses and also ensure that they are uh, that they are applied in an ethical way. It's great. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, Frederick and Antonio. And thank you, Kai. Okay, so I think... I'll see you in the next week for the next episode until I get my next question. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. It was a pleasure. And I'm glad also Kai has already uh, has that spirit of the exponential speed up. So from a million years to 100 years to next week. So that's great. So continue exploring, Kai. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.